Hi, thanks for joining us again in our study uh, on the book of Numbers. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 12 today. It's entitled The Wilderness Wanderings and entitled this one, Count Their Blessings. Now, for those of you who know the song, Count Your Blessings, you're wondering why do we change it around. We'll talk about that in a few moments here. But uh, the New York Times back in August, August 10th actually, they published an article called Quarantine Envy. And they talked about the battles that people were going through observing everyone else's stuff or what they had and craving what they had, and they, they entitled it Quarantine Envy. And uh, in that article, it was interesting, there was a French-Moroccan journalist named Leila Soleimani, and she uh, retired, uh, not retired, but like decided to just take the quarantine time and go to her little cottage. She had a small uh, cottage in the French uh, countryside. And while she was there, she just decided that she was going to write a quarantine diary every day, submit it to the newspaper, the French newspaper, and they would uh, just publish the article. Well, as they, they did that, she received scathing comments and remarks from the people of Paris, those who had small apartments and were just finding it so disheartening, and, and they were disgruntled and envious that she could retreat to just a small, small cottage in the, in the countryside. So the, uh, the newspaper actually decided to stop carrying uh, her articles because of the, the people's response of envy. I don't think it's just them. I mean, have you found yourself at times, I remember when, when all the quarantine stuff started, I was looking and go, man, it must be really nice for the, all these Hollywood elites who are telling us, you need to quarantine, you need to quarantine. And I found myself even thinking, and I saw posts and memes and uh, tweets that just said, hey, if I had a $6 million home with a pool and a go-kart track and a basketball court, I could, I could quarantine with style too. And we could find ourselves facing and, and becoming envious of, of what others had. Aristotle said it this way. He said, envy is the pain at the sight of another, another's good fortune. It's stirred by those who have what we ought or what we think we ought to have. And we often look at the idea of counting your blessings, but when we battle with envy, envy can turn into counting the blessings of others because you feel you deserve or you desire them and you find yourself getting frustrated, not rejoicing with those who rejoice, but you start looking at what other people have, whether it's possessions or position, the accolades, and you become envious because you see what they have and you desire and feel that you personally deserve them. When we look at Numbers chapter 12, we back up a little bit and, and remind ourselves of Numbers chapter 11. When we get to Numbers chapter 11, it's highlighted the complaints of Israel. And we talked about that, how they were longing for the past. They were looking for more possessions and a more comfortable present. They looked back to say, I want this to be better right now. They were questioning their leadership. They, they had issues with Moses. And ultimately, by extension, they were questioning God. And Israel's leader himself even questioned and wondered about God's purpose and what he was doing. And if this was all it was, please just kill me. And Moses gets that point. But God graciously provided Moses with 70 spirit-filled men to help in the leadership. And as that occurred, we saw that many of the things that happened were a result of those outside of the camp. And even as those outside of the camp, the mixed multitude, the rabble, as the passage talks about, those who were not Jewish by blood came in and started to cause the grumbling and the complaining and the longings for the past, the discontent about the, the present, and they became disheartened about the future. And we see all that, and all of that continues as a context to chapter 12. Yes, we saw at the end of chapter 11 that they, they journeyed from Kibroth Hata'ava to Hazaroth and abode at Hazaroth. And when they're at Hazaroth, there's going to be a new issue that arises, and that's where we find ourselves in chapter 12. All of the grumbling, though it was curbed, though it was dealt with, it was not entirely gone. Those who, who dealt with and God dealt with the greedy, God dealt with those who were craving, but there was still grumbling that was occurring. And in fact, just like in chapter 11, where the, the grumbling in public affects the leadership of Moses and he personally, as the grumbling continues and as the discontentment continues, we see two more of Israel's leaders battling with a complaining spirit. 
with an envious spirit, with an attitude that needed to be adjusted. And the wilderness often highlights the attitudes that God wants to address in our heart. When we go through those difficult times, the attitudes that we might be able to suppress during the good times are then revealed in these difficult times. And we find ourselves with Miriam and Aaron in chapter 12, grumbling and complaining. And they were craving what another person had. And that's going to be the the driving factor of chapter 12, that they wanted something that someone else had. They felt they deserved it. They felt it was owed to them. And they struggled with a battle of envy in their life. So they grumbled. They complained. They didn't complain to God. They didn't complain to Moses. They started doing it to themselves, possibly to others as well. We see in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses. Now, the, the word spake against Moses, we see that Miriam here is the chief instigator. She is the, the one who is driving this. Her name is mentioned first in the position of priority in the, in the Hebrew text and, and as well in the English text. And the verb spake against is in the feminine, which, which highlights that Miriam was the one who was doing the, she was the vocal one in the pair. Now that doesn't mean that Aaron is innocent. He went along with it. She, he is, himself is complaining. He's going to face chastisement and judgment as well. Not to the extent that Miriam will, but Miriam is the chief instigator in this issue. So the question is, what's the issue, dear? What's, what are you grumbling? What are you complaining about? You're in a, a great position. I mean, you look at most of the people would probably be envious of Miriam, but Miriam finds herself envious of someone else. And so she brings up this issue. The issue that she says is that because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. So Moses has been married to this Ethiopian woman we find. In some of your texts, um, it may say the Cushite or the lady from Cush. The, the text does highlight that he did marry an Ethiopian woman. Look at the very end of it. It says, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So the, the author of this, Moses, says, yes, it is true. I married an Ethiopian woman. I married a, a woman from the, the, uh, the place of Cush. And so it is a legitimate marriage according to the, the scripture here. It's not illegitimate. It's not wrong. Now, the question is, who is this Ethiopian woman? There's a lot of debate that occurs here. There's questions that arise. Was it Zipporah? In Exodus chapter 2, we know that Moses married Zipporah. In fact, Habakkuk 3 talks about that Cush and Midian are in proximity to each other. So could it be that Zipporah was this Cushite woman? Possibly, but why would Miriam wait so long, kids later, time later, to now bring up the complaint. Maybe she feels like this is the time, I have the ability. Or is it another possibility that Zipporah has died and Moses has married a second wife, a woman from Ethiopia? Or is there the possibility a second wife along with Zipporah? The Bible doesn't give us a clear definitive answer in this. But we know this, that Moses married an Ethiopian woman, a woman from Cush, which is going to, and and Miriam, what she is doing here is she is addressing the fact that this woman is different from us. She is not one of us. And your marriage to her is questionable. Is it an issue of her race? That she would have been black, that she would have been darker skinned than the Jewish individuals? Is it an issue of ethnicity, the fact that she's not a Jew? So some of these questions start to arise and it causes tension in the life of Miriam and Aaron and Moses in the family. And so this this arises. What's interesting is, was Moses even allowed to marry her? Because she's not a Jew. So was he allowed to marry her? And we could instantly jump and say, well, no, Jews are only supposed to marry Jews. But look at what Exodus 34 says, but Deuteronomy 7 is the one I have here. Both of them are parallel passages. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, okay, that's the context, when you go into Canaan land, the Canaanites, you shall make no covenant with them, talking about the Canaanites, and you shall show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them. He doesn't say you shall not intermarry with anybody who's not a Jew. He tells them you shall not intermarry with the Canaanites, 
That's who you shall not intermarry with, giving your daughters to their sons or taking your daughters for their sons. Why does he say that? For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. So we see that they are told not to marry the Canaanites in whose land they were going to be going to. Why? Because they would potentially turn you away from God. Interfaith marriages are not good. To not have the same spiritual virtues and values is not endorsed by God. We're told in the Corinthians, don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. We look at even here, people have different religious views. It doesn't make a good home. You want to find somebody who has the same spiritual values and doctrine and positions that you do that help in the home situation. So Deuteronomy is highlighting that they were not supposed to marry the Canaanite women. It doesn't say that they could not marry an Ethiopian woman. You know, marriage outside the covenant uh, community of Israel was not forbidden except for the tribes of Canaan. Remember, who does Boaz marry? He marries Ruth. Ruth was not a Jew. She was a Moabitess. She took the Jewish faith. She adopted the Jewish faith. And so therefore then was able to, as, as Boaz being her kinsman redeemer, Boaz took her, and she, but she was not, not a Jew. And there's no condemnation for Boaz. In fact, Ruth and Boaz are in the lineage of David, in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So there, it wasn't a hard and fast, Jews only marry Jews. That became a tradition. That became something that happened. But that was not a directive from God. The directive to, from God to the Jews was when you go into Canaan, you do not marry these pagans. They have a different perspective and value. And when we see Israel's history with the kings, when they begin to intermarry, I mean, the classic is Ahab and Jezebel. Not a pretty, he married a Canaanite. As, and no, no good comes out of it when you look through the Old Testament, when there's that interfaith marriage. So that is what is being driven at when we talk about was Moses allowed to be, it wasn't because of her skin color. It wasn't wrong for Moses to marry. Moses was permitted. But was this a problem? For Moses, no. He looks and says, the law does not forbid it. My behavior is appropriate. For Miriam and Aaron, yes, they felt this behavior was wrong. They felt it was inappropriate for Moses to marry somebody who was not a Jew possibly it seems like there was a racial tension that mo they were upset that she was a different race or ethnicity and so there was frustration by Miriam and there may be some plausible grounds on their perspective they look and they might have some concern why would they have some concern well they're looking and saying Israel was told the dangers of intermarriage especially with pagans okay she's not from a Jewish background so is there a potential problem? If she's not truly converted, if she's not truly a follower of Jehovah, could there be a potential? So they're looking and saying, ooh, there's, there's potential danger here. Because of the danger of being drawn away from worshiping the true God and following idols, they were concerned about the leader of Israel making a questionable decision practically. Moses, this might not have been the best decision for you. We don't think you should have done it. As well... Much of the last chapter, if you remember chapter 11, who were the problems caused by? The non-Jews, the mixed multitude, the rabble. Is she potentially, was she one who came out of Egypt, this, this Ethiopian woman? Was she one who came out of Egypt and Moses has met her and she was part of the original mixed multitude? And now the mixed multitude just caused problems. Now they're looking and saying, oh, wait, she could be a problem. She's now got some influence. She's the neck that turns the head. She's the one who's right in with Moses. Could we have some issues? So potentially, is there some the, uh, cause for their concerns? Possibly. There is, and they, they look at it. But sadly, when we look at this passage, what has happened with it, there are people who have run not to the potentials of Moses being turned away to to paganism or Moses being influenced in a way that's not godly. They run to and they look at the say and talk about the dangers of interracial marriage because obviously Moses married a, a woman of a different race or a different, different ethnicity. 
And we look at, is it racism? Is it xenophobia? Most of, and xenophobia is that fear of an ethnicity or a, a, a different nation or peoples than, than your own. Is there, is there that potential? A number of commentators and scholars, they go to and they talk about that Miriam's comment was not simply just one of, oh, just stating the facts, but it was a, a comment that says, you chose to marry somebody who is not like us, somebody who's different than us, a different skin color than us, and they, they highlight and they talk about racism. So was, was this passage dealing with the dangers of interracial marriage? I don't see anything, even in scriptures when we look at it, that would prohibit interracial marriage other than the problems people might face in terms of cultural prejudices. That's the only, and we see that that happened here, that it caused a little bit of tension in, in the home here. But any couple that chooses to get married in a culture that has a high degree of racism, they're, they're asking for all kinds of tension directed against their marriage. If they understand that, if they understand, hey, in our culture, there might be cultural prejudices. In our culture, there might be some tensions that arise in our home. But if they're, if they're willing to do that and deal with that, it doesn't mean that they're sinning by go ahead and entering into a marriage covenant. Moses was in an interracial marriage. He wasn't sinning. He was not wrong. And in Numbers 12, is, is Moses going to be receiving the judgment? No. Who do we see receive the judgment? In the passage, we'll see later on, Miriam is the one with that, that racist or xenophobic reaction, and she is the one who is going to be punished, her and Aaron, for that. They, what they're doing is they're using Moses' wife's ethnicity and race as a smokescreen to complain about their real issue. This is not their real issue. Their issue is not the fact that Moses married a woman of a different race, of a different ethnicity. That is not their real issue. Their real issue is going to be highlighted in the next verse when we, when we get there and we look at what are they really driving at. But it's really interesting to me when you see, and I shouldn't be surprised by it, but sometimes it's like, wow. When we have the collision of Christianity and culture, when the Bible just comes right at the intersection of where we're at in culture, don't we see this today? Don't we see, aren't we faced with the fact that statements about race are often used as a smokescreen for a different agenda? You turn it, you, you Google anything, you go anywhere, you go to Amazon, you go to, you go to YouTube, you go to Facebook, you're constantly being faced with this statement, Black Lives Matter. We see that. It's, it's all over our country right now. And the Bible here, like, come, I believe, comes and just smacks the two head on. So when we look at this phrase, Black Lives Matter, you know, personally, I, I make no qualms. Racism is real. Racism is a sin, and the hatred and oppression toward an individual race, toward an ethnicity, is both real and it's sinful, period. It is present. We, we can't look, it is foolish for us to look in our culture and say there's no more racism. There's no more racism around the world. That's been, that's been done away with. Racism is real, racism is a sin, and it is wrong, Period. And we have to come to grips with that. And as Bible believers, we have to espouse that. That is the biblical truth. When we go to Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, Paul is talking uh, at, at Mars Hill. He's, he's talking and he's, he's going to give his, uh, in Athens, he's going to give his argument for God to the, you know, the unknown God. But look at what he says down in verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and bound of their habitation. He looks and he says, the God who made the world made of one blood all nations of men who dwell upon the earth. We are all brothers and sisters of humanity. Yes, we are different colors. 
but we are all of the same humanity. Yes, there are different cultures, but we are all of one humanity. God has made us from one blood. So we, we can't get by the fact that from God's perspective, the God who made all of us made us all similar, made us all alike. Yes, there are some different colors, but we have to look at, okay, taking that perspective, what do we do with this phrase, Black Lives Matters? What do we do with it? How are we supposed to respond? How are we supposed to act when we hear it, when we see it posted, when it's talked about around the coffee shop or around the, uh, the water cooler, the proverbial water cooler, when you're talking at work? What do we do? Black Lives Matter, as a statement, we have to recognize that that is a statement, it is a sentence. Black Lives Matter, that statement is biblical and right. As a sentence, black lives do matter. There's no way around it. That statement, however, has been hijacked by a movement, by a movement with an agenda. Truthfully, I believe that statement starts too low. Let's talk about that for just a few moments here. When we look at this phrase, Black Lives Matter, this statement, and we look at it not just as a statement, but let's look at it as a movement for a second. The question must arise, who does it matter to? Matter, matters to whom? In what way? If there is a Marxist foundation to this movement, which there is, that's, I'm not going to get into all of it. You can go, you can do the research, but those who founded it and wording that's used, such as comrades and other things, I mean, there's, there is an agenda that is being driven here. Which it is, do you remember what Marx said? He called religion the opiate of the masses. He looked and he was atheistic. Marxism, and you look across the world, Marxism, communism, it is con traditionally, it is atheistic. Okay, so it's driving to a point that it, it is an atheistic movement. If you remove then the one who is transcendent, God, if you say we are atheistic, no God, you remove the transcendent one, then you remove the ultimate purpose and meaning for life. And if you have no ultimate purpose and meaning for life, then the idea of something mattering in a world without purpose, it's ludicrous. So if you're looking and saying, well, there's no, there's no one we're trying to provide meaning to, then to try and purpose matter, what matters, it's, it's ludicrous. Well, let's go a little bit more. The question must arise then, well then, if God doesn't determine who what, or what matters, then who determines what matters? If mattering doesn't really matter, then who determines it? Well, the movement will talk about the idea that it is the corporate community. It takes a village. We've heard that before. We've heard, that's not even new. We've heard that years gone by, that it takes a village to raise. As much as you're going to allow them, it's going to take not just the family, not just the family structure. It takes all of us to determine what really matters and what, what is important. But if the community is not able to do that, and there's not a transcendent one who does that, then who steps in? Logically, historically, then the one who steps in is the power, the authority known as the government or the state that steps in to determine what matters. We're seeing that played out. We're seeing it all behind the smokescreen of a statement that is true. A statement that says black lives matter. They absolutely do. But the agenda that is behind it, the organization that has hijacked that statement has a completely other separate agenda. You go a little bit further with this. Can I as a Bible believer support, and we see Christians supporting the movement. We see them posting. We're seeing them talk about social justice. And we're seeing them talk about Black Lives Matter and critical race theory. You'll, you'll see those, pe those phrases and you're like, what is all of that? And it's all driving this agenda that is here through this movement. Can I support that? Can you support it? Pastor, Pastor highlighted a few of them in his last message on Colossians. But if you continue, and you can't go there now because as they've gotten pushback in the last months, as it's been highlighted that this is a movement that is not equating with their statement, they're pulling down core beliefs. But thankfully, people have already got them, and you can, you can easily find them through a Google search. But you tell me, 
You tell me, you as a Bible-believing Christian, can you support these statements, these core beliefs from Black Lives Matter? We are guided by the fact that all Black Lives Matter, regardless of actual or perceived sexual identity, gender identity, gender expression, everybody matters. It doesn't matter how they identify with their biological gender or not. They can be, therefore, will make space for a transgendered brother or sister to participate and to lead. Transgender means I don't accept my birth gender. I'm going to transition. I'm going to be another gender, not my normal birth gender. We do dismantle the cisgender privilege. If you're like me, you read and you're like, what in the world is cisgender and why do I have to know all these genders? Didn't it just, doesn't God say he made male and female? Yes, it does. Biblically, that's what Jesus says. Cisgender is a term that just means your birth gender. So we work to dismantle cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women who continue to be disproportionately impacted by a trans antagonistic violence. So if you disagree with transgenderism, you are a violent and there's violence against you. We build a space that affirms black women and is free from sexism, misogyny, and environments that are man-centered. So we want to tear down the man, we want to tear down the white man, and we want to have anybody else who's not that against, against them. They go on, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family. In other words, the biblical family we are against. The mother, father, son, daughter, children, we are against that. That is what the Western prescribed nuclear family is, the biblical family. We foster a queer affirming network. In other words, we are going to be pro-homosexual. Uh, Look at the bottom, the belief that the world is all, or the belief that all in the world are heterosexual. In other words, God made male and female to procreate for the pleasure of each other. And even though the Bible goes against and talks about the sins of homosexuality, we are going to look and say, no, that is not the authority. Our community says, this is okay, therefore, that matters to us. So you tell me, very simply, with your, with your Bible knowledge, can a Bible-believing Christians support a movement like Black Lives Matter? Wholeheartedly, emphatically, absolutely not. We cannot. It is a movement with an agenda, I believe, straight from the pit of hell. It is with a purpose to destroy the family, to destroy the church, and to ultimately give Satan a victory, which we know won't happen, but he's working hard and it is working hard for his agenda. As a statement, I really believe it starts too low. It starts, the, the statement initially, te- it gives us a racial, racial tension. Because as soon as you hear it, if you're white, you're like, well, white lives matter too. If you're Asian, you're like, well, Asian lives matter too. And if you're Hispanic, well, what about Hispanic lives? Don't they matter? And it instantly causes a racial tension when we hear the phrase, When we look at the scriptures, Colossians chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, you look throughout the Bible, and what does it say? God, the creator of all things, made mankind in his image for the purpose of bringing the transcendent one, bringing him, the creator of all, glory. And all who bear his image matter to him. Therefore, because everyone that he has created matters to God, therefore all people must matter in our sight. That, that raises the, the bar. It doesn't just start with one race. It looks and says biblically, and we ought to be championing this, that biblically every single human, Asian, Arab, Hispanic, Black, white, Native American, fill in the blank. Every single human matters to God, and therefore they must matter to us. That's why we send missionaries. That's why we want to share the gospel. That's why we need to go and to tell people about what we have, because the gospel, it guarantees that we all have the exact same access to the exact same Lord, because we have the exact same need of sin being redeemed We all have the exact same need of the exact same salvation. At the foot of the cross, we are all equal. 
There is neither Jew nor Gentile. Scythian, barbarian, those were racial and ethnic terms. At the foot of the cross, we are all equal. And we as Christians ought to champion this concept and be talking about it, not trying to enhance racial tension. But as we look at it, I mean, what I just talked about, that's, that's the tip of the iceberg. So as we look at that, that, that idea of racism, as we look at the idea of xenophobia, as we look at the concepts of racial tension in America, as Christians, we ought to be continuing this conversation. We ought to be informed. We ought to be articulate on the subject so that when we are asked, when we are challenged, we can say, well, what do you mean by Black Lives Matter? Not just instantly, well, no, no, no. What do you mean by that? Are you talking about the statement? Or are you talking about the agenda? What do, you, what do you mean? We're able to be articulate. We're able to talk about it. But let's also remember as we continue, please realize that everyone who says Black Lives Matter, they're not instantly members of Antifa. They're not instantly on some radical agenda. There have been many, many, many people who are being swept up because that statement sounds good and it is a good statement. It doesn't instantly make everybody driving the agenda. They may be willingly going along unknown and they might need someone to come along and graciously share with them and show them what this is about it would be unfair for us to make that statement just as much as it would be unfair by the fact that I will probably, because I've spoken this way and said this, I'll be called a racist because of these statements. And that's not fair to me because I'm not a racist. And it would be completely unfair, just like has happened to some of our, some of our people here. There have been college students who unknowingly put some stuff like this up and some people in our church have went to them and said, you're like a member of Antifa. You're really close to being a terrorist. It's not fair to them. They just didn't understand. Granted, they have to be aware. They have to learn. They have to go forward. And that's what we need to do. We need to be culturally taking the scriptures and plugging them in. Learning how does it interact. In this passage, intersects. This was the issue of Miriam and Aaron. It was their smoke screen. They were looking, and just like the organization uses that statement of Black Lives Matter as a smokescreen for their agenda, Miriam and Aaron are using the marriage of Moses to a black lady as a smokescreen to the real issue. What is their issue? Verse two. Their real issue comes out, and they said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? Their real complaint was not that Moses was interracially married. Their real complaint was that it was a direct shot at Moses as the anointed leader, as the mediator. Is he the only one? Is he unfit to be the sole leader? Because look, he made an unwise decision in our mind. So is Moses the only one that we should be trusting in? Their complaint was not to God. Their complaint was not to Moses. They complained amongst themselves, maybe amongst others, trying to rally support around this idea that Moses might be unfit as the leader. They wanted Moses' position. They say, hasn't God spoken to us as well? He's, he's spoken directly to us too. Haven't, haven't we acted question? Oh, no, we haven't. We haven't acted questionably. We have not made an unsound judgment like Moses, and yet we're all gonna put all of our trust in Moses? Hasn't God spoken to us too? You look, at, you look at what they were saying. They wanted what Moses had. There was envy for his position, for his prominence, for his power. They wanted that. Is Moses the only one who spoke through God? Through? No, we know that the, he used Miriam a prophetess when they come over across the Red Sea. Aaron is the intercessor with the sacrifices and God has spoken to Aaron as well. They're saying we should be in the prominence because God has spoken to us as well. They directed their complaint at Moses. It was a, a direct shot because he made an unwise or incompetent choice. He may be potentially influenced because he married someone who's not like us. Maybe they, they may have also been frustrated because they did not receive the Spirit of God as the other 70 in the last chapter. 
They may be envious of them as well. Well, what about us? We've done this before. We're there. We've been used by God before. Why are we not now? We ought to. And so they're directing their desires, their envy, and complaining and grumbling against Moses, against the leadership. And by extension, as always, it is a rebellion against God. And so that's the real issue that drives chapter 12. That Moses and Miriam find themselves envious. And we need to be careful of our envy, of our craving what others have. It really is an underrated sin. Grumbling, it may be, it may be our country's pastime, but envy is the motor that drives our economy, one, in, one individual said. In fact, he goes a little bit further. Let me, let me read this for a second. When he talks about our battles with envy, he says, many television commercials work because they stir up envy in our hearts. We are encouraged to envy our neighbor's car, our neighbor's house, even as trivial, trivial as the fluffiness of our neighbor's towels, which of course is due to the fact that they're using the right fabric softener. We are constantly urged to envy anything our neighbor has that we don't. In our culture, the commandment is no longer, thou shalt not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor, but rather, thou shalt covet everything your neighbor has, and thou shalt acquire as much of it as possible, as much as your credit card permits. Envy is no longer viewed as a sin, but as a civic virtue. And Miriam and Aaron were sucked into grumbling through the path of envy. As we look at our lives, and we look at what God has given to us, and we look at the battle of envy in our lives, Miriam and Aaron went down this path of grumbling because of the path of envy. And what do we, when we look at just these first two verses, completely packed, what, what do we learn? We grumble when we compare our situation to someone else's. Miriam and Aaron were grumbling because they were envious of Moses' situation. They wanted his position. We find ourselves doing the same thing. We envy when we compare ourselves to someone else. We guarantee or we grumble about people because it's easier than going to them and seeking to resolve the issue. If Miriam and Aaron truly had an issue about Moses' marriage, they should have went directly to Moses and talked with Moses about it. Not to go around and grumble, but it's a whole lot easier to go around and grumble and complain than it is to go and to deal with it. We grumble when we compare and declare ourselves superior to others. Is Moses the only one? No. In fact, he's done some things that are questionable. We have not. Is Moses the only one that God has spoken to? No. He's also spoken to us. And we find ourselves... You're, maybe your boss does something that you wouldn't agree with. And you're like, I could do such a better job. And we start to find ourselves battling with envy, complaining then to coworkers, moving around and talking to other people in order to maybe try and gain an advantage. And we grumble, we complain. We grumble because our lives aren't as good as we imagine someone else's life to be. We look and we say, well, their life must be so much better. Moses has got all of this. Maybe the 70 men, they're now in that position. Wow, they must have the, all that power and authority. We can, we can look and say someone else's situation so much better than ours. And the irony is there are other people who look at our situation and become envious of us and the situation you're in. The person who's got a busy schedule wants a, a, a simpler schedule. But the person who's got the simple schedule feels like they're just finding themselves in a rut and would love to be challenged to do more. The person who, you know, is single is longing for the, 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 the love and the commitment of marriage. And the people in marriage are like, wow, when I was single, I had so much more flexibility. And we find ourselves struggling and envious in all these different ways because we imagine that someone else's life is so much better than ours. We grumble when we feel we deserve more recognition. That's what Mir Miriam and Aaron wanted more. Isn't God, God talked to us too. 
We should have some leadership. We should be in the, I know these 70 men, but hey, what about us? We, we deserve a little bit more. We've done a lot here for you. We, we've been in that situation. We've been present. But did you notice what happens at the end of verse two? When they grumble, what happens? When we grumble, let's remember this. And the Lord heard it. Oh, we might grumble in secret. We might grumble only to a couple of our friends who we know have our back. We might only grumble to one or two people, or maybe we just grumble on the internet, you know, through a, we just grumble on our tweets, we just grumble on our Instagram account, we just grumble, and that's all we do. But it's not a lot to anybody. God hears our complaining. God hears our envy is grumblings. And so we have to be careful. We have to check this wilderness attitude and say, wait, how do I address it? What do I do? It reminds me of Hebrews chapter 13. Let your conduct be without covetousness or without a love for money, without that love for things. And be content with such things as you have. Why? For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The remedy of envy and covetousness is contentment. And how do we and where do we find contentment? We find it in Jesus Christ. We find it in him, in his presence, in his provisions, in his protection. Not in what everybody else has. Not in the better life or the sweet life of this person or that person. We find our provision. We find our protection. We find our comfort in the fact that God is with us just like the Jews had just as God was always present and there in their midst, the same is true for us, that Jesus Christ is the all-sufficient one. He is the one we must lean upon and trust in and find our contentment and satisfaction in him because it will help us when we battle those feelings of envy. This week, we find those struggles those desires to complain because of what someone else has, and we begin to count their blessings. Let's take a moment, and let's rest in the blessings that God has given to us. Let's count our blessings and recognize God's provision, his protection, and his presence. So God, I pray that you would help us in our culture this week, in our world, to find contentment and rest in you. And God, I pray that you would help our nation, that you would heal our nation. God, that you would help us to be light and salt in a world that is just vastly driving themselves apart. Lord, for the the cultural tensions of race relations in our nation, and even around the world, but in our nation, God, I pray that people would find healing not through a government program, not through an agenda-driven organization, But Lord, that because we are going out and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, that people would recognize that you are the one who offers true hope and peace and comfort and true unity. Lord, help us to be ambassadors of that message. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much.